we'll get started. Um, we are uh, Ahoy Comics. Uh, we're a brand new publisher, and our first two books have just come out, and this is our first ever convention appearance. So thank you for coming out. Um, my name's Stuart Moore. I'm a writer of one of the launch series, and I'm also uh, I also handle something called Ops for the company, which even I haven't quite figured out what it is. <laughs> But um, I know so I've seen some of you guys come by um, come by the booth already. Um, uh, how many of you? Have, can I just get a show of hands? How many of you have seen our books or or at least our relentless publicity? Like, okay, so about half. Okay. Um, that's good. Uh, how many of you have actually read one of our books? Okay. All right. All right. Um, the happiest people here. Yes. <laughs> Well, we're very, we're very excited to present all this stuff, but uh, I, I'm, and I'm, I'm going to have the panel introduce themselves. But first, I want to start with Tom Pyre, who's on my left. He's the editor-in-chief of Ahoy, as well as the writer and co-creator of the company's first two titles, The Wrong Earth and High Heaven. And Tom, can you just give us a few words about what Ahoy is and how it came to be? Well, uh, Hart Seeley, who's in the crowd, our publisher, and Frank Camuso here and I are old friends. We've been hanging out together for decades, sometimes doing creative things like writing humor pieces or, and whatnot. And uh, at some point, Seeley, who was a reporter, um, retired from his career reporting, newspaper reporting. And he decided that as a reporter, he was insufficiently hated by people. So he wanted to become, <laughs> he wanted to become a publisher. So uh, we, we talked about this a couple of years ago, and we put this together. We put together a comic book company. It took almost two years to put our first comic out, and it came out a week and a half ago, and it was, it was crazy. Okay. Well, um, why, don't we, uh, why don't we move right on from that to the awkward part where the panel introduces themselves. So okay. uh, we'll just go down the line. Frank? Hi, guys. I'm Frank Camuso. I'm a... Uh, I write and draw graphic novels, uh, mostly for children, and um, I have a backup, a couple of backup stories in Wrong Earth. I, I just drew those. So. I'm Todd Klein. I am in a longtime letter for comics, 40 years plus, and I am also a logo designer, and I designed logos for Ahoy, including the company symbol and all of their titles so far. Uh, I'm Lloyd Richardson, uh, I'm an inker, and I'm June Brinkman's husband. <laughs> June just probably went out and worn down for the big league. I'm June Brinkman, I'm a penciler, and I'm Roy Richardson's wife. Uh, She's not very much known for <laughs> I'm Jamal Agle. I am not June Brigman's husband, but um, I'm also the uh, penciler and co-creator of The Wrong Earth. Yes. All right, and uh, before we move on, there's one more member of the Ahoy team who doesn't get enough credit, but who makes a lot of what we do possible and makes us all laugh while we do it. And of course, I'm talking about, no wait, that's, that's not him, that's, that's St. Peter from, uh, from The Wrong Earth. Amen. Uh, no, it's not Edgar Allan Poe. It's not Edgar Allan Poe. He's important. You'll see him. But uh, oh no, that's Cap that's Sergeant Mittens from uh, from Captain Ginger. Aww. We'll get to him. But he's not who I'm talking about either. Oh, oh no, that's Deuce. Deuce. That's Deuce from uh, from also from the Wrong Earth. Um, she's great. No, definitely not. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I am of course talking about the Ahoy Blowy Man <laughs> who uh, runs around. Uh, who, we, you can see down in our booth sometimes. He's pictured here with his legal guardian, Ahoy publisher Hart Seeley. Um, the Ahoy Blowy Man was rocketed to earth when the car dealership of his birth tragically exploded. Um, he doesn't exactly fight for truth and justice, but uh, he, he does spread the word about Ahoy. And, um, we, we've refrained from uh, turning him on too much in the booth because he's kind of loud and overbearing, but, uh, but you can come see him down there if you want. So If you come, we'll turn him on. So. Anyway, uh, from there, I, I just want to cover each of the titles um, a little bit one at a time and have you guys who are working on them talk about them, um, and then we'll open things up a bit, a little more than that. The Wrong Earth is our first title. As Tom said, it's been out for, I think, about two and a half weeks, and we've gotten a wonderful response to it. Uh, Tom, do you and Jamal just want to talk about it a little bit? Either one, I don't know who wants to start. Sure, okay. Well, it's, 
The Wrong Earth is the story of a sort of campy, Silver Age style, upstanding superhero, and a more modern version of the same hero who's violent and grim and gritty and stick it to the man. And uh, they and become depressed, really, and depressed, really depressed and tired. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and he, he hasn't shaved. He hasn't razors. shaved. Yeah. He's just too. Razorless world. <laughs> drinks. <laughs> anyway, uh, the two of them swap universes. They switch Earths. So the grim, gritty one has to be in this goofy place where where the police are all nice, you know. Yes, and the bad guys aren't so bad. <laughs> yeah, they're more nuisances than anything else. Right. And the and the the poor, naive Silver Age figure has to be in this rotten world where all the police are corrupt and all the violence is ultra. And uh, we'll just see, it's like a, I was describing today as kind of a double Howard the Duck situation. They're both trapped in worlds they never made. And uh, it's just seeing how they cope with it and whether they do. Jamal, you have anything to add? Oh yeah, no, I mean, it, it's, been one of the most fun projects that I've had the opportunity to work on, you know, especially working with Tom, who, like, we'll get on the phone for, like, an hour straight and just laugh our heads off, because it's just, the whole concept is just so absurd. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the, the, the whole thing for me has been, you know, having that dichotomy to play with, with all of the characters, because you, you see how different you know, even our main villain is a character called Number One. And on Earth Alpha, Number One is sort of, I, I like it Number One is sort of a cross between Paul Lind and Charles Nelson Riley with, with a little Frank Gorshin thrown in. Whereas, you know, the Earth Omega version of Number One is much more nihilistic. It's sort of like Tim Roth. Uh, you know, sort of, you know, Sid and Nancy, very punk, very, you know, dark and gritty, and his, their henchmen reflect that as well. You know, the on Earth Alpha, they, you know, I was very inspired by the prisoner and their outfits, and you know, yeah. and on Earth Omega, it's all fetish gear and leather vests and, <laughs> and bonded masks. <coughs> We, um, we also have, uh, sorry, do you want to? Well, I just want to add that number one is a villain who, like many uh, comic book villains, he, he will do crime sprees that have a theme, but because he's a narcissist, the theme is always him. <laughs> That's a really good idea. Um, I have a series of, I, I wanted to ask Jamal to comment on this. I, we have a series of process shots here. This is, um, this is actually the cover to Wrong Earth number six, and this is the first time it's been shown anywhere. And I have the uh, series of shots right. showing it being made. So that's your sketch. Yeah, so this is, I, so Tom and I were trying to figure out what we wanted to do with number six cover. And we wanted to go back to the mirror motif. And originally Tom had suggested, because, you know, if you've read number one, or spoilers for those who haven't read number one, the, the transport between Earths happens in a magic mirror. So we, I didn't really necessarily want to use the mirror again because that's, that's sort of a reoccurring theme in a couple of the covers. So I came up with this idea of having uh, both reflections but in a water motif. So I did two versions. The other version is much more placid and we, we picked this one because it's much more action oriented. So this one is a, me just basically going, all right, I did this idea, how the hell am I going to pull this off? Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> then we go to this. this so yeah, so now we go to the pencil stick. <coughs> what I ended up doing was I, there's a program called Manga Studio, or, or a clip, uh, clip paint studio, and I drew the figures digitally, um, imported them into Photoshop, and then I did on the uh, uh, Dragonfly, I use a uh, ripple filter to warp the figure in the sketch, then we <laughs> redrew everything on paper, uh, just pencil paper. So, and then it's great. The paint stage, so that's all brush. Um, I use a black and ink and a Series 3000 shrap brush. Except for the bubbles, that's all pen and everything else. And when I'm doing figure work, I try to work primarily with the brush. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's a uh, number three. So this is big. Yeah. And then, and then, okay, so this was the, this was, I had to figure out how to make the ripple, so that was a, 
a separate filter effect. I actually found a tutorial on DeviantArt for that, and it worked out really, really well. I was actually able to move it into position. But then again, you know, there's a series of masks and color, you know, for every layer. It actually, as I was building the coloring for the cover, I ended up with like 19 layers of separate effects. <laughs> but I'm really happy with the way that the cover came out. Yeah, it's actually a little bit washed out on the screen. Like on yeah. my screen, it's a, it's a lot more vivid. Yeah, it's a lot yeah. more vivid. Yeah. It's great. Yeah. It is great. Well, thanks. No problem. Um, before we move on, I want to um, I want to ask uh, Frank, as he said, drew uh, the back feature in the first issue of um, of the Wrong Earth, which is a solo story of Stinger, um, the Earth Alpha yeah, Earth Stinger, yeah, I guess. Yeah. And uh, I got a couple panels of that. And you, um, one thing you, we we've, we've seen people do mock um, mock aged comics before, but you really took it to another level. With the, <laughs> you can see the wood grain in the paper, and you can see the the fake show through from the yeah. other side. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, do you want to say anything about the story, like how it worked? How it it, you know, yeah, it's a, um, it, it was, I, I've always loved superheroes, but I really can't draw like Jamal, you know? But I can't draw like but you, I, so But I can come close, but, and basically the closest I can get is like, you know, like the bastard child of Will Eisner and Jack Cole, you know, and that's really kind of where, if I had to draw that stuff, that's where I would live, and that's kind of, and I kind of support that, yeah, that's kind of, so I was like, well, I can do it this way, you know, and that's, and, and because the style kind of feels a little dated, I thought, well, it should, because it's a golden age book. Yeah. But you know what, you know what I love about that sequence is that Stinger takes off his mask and he still has a little work. <laughs> I wanted to look. I wanted the character to kind of change over time, but I wanted it to be really simple, right, right, right. simple yeah. golden age look. It looks so good. And I wanted the, the dots, and I was like, well, because I wanted him to have dots like, you know, little orphan Annie or right, kind of right, tin yeah. tin type of thing going on. And. And I was like, well, what if I did it with the mask where he's just black and I just make the, give him white dots on the mask? That's all it is anyway, it's a triangle, so what if they're just circles? So that was... It's wonderful cartooning. I also wanted yeah. to, because it's coming out next week, I wanted to, you to be able to plug oh, your, you. your book. Um, yeah, it's come, I have some at my table so you can stop by. It's Edison Beaker, Creature Seeker, and it's uh, um, not published through Ahoy, it's published through uh, another small press place called like Penguin Random House. <laughs> <laughs> just a little, just a little fashion in New York. It's it's a kids graphic novel. I did everything. I wrote, drew, and uh, sorry, Todd lettered it yeah. and uh, and colored. So um, and it's kids and monsters, and uh, it's kind of really my first foray into something more fantasy based. And I had a great time, but it was a lot. There was a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> How many pages? It's 160. Oh, yeah. and it is a lot of work. It's a lot of work, yeah. Full color. Wow, um, okay. I know. I should be working on two right now. But there it goes. Don't think about it. I know. <laughs> exactly. Oh, we should mention that the Stinger Backup Story uh, was written by a very talented yes. writer named Paul Constant. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, he's, he's amazing. One. You're going to love him. Yeah. yeah. All right, um, go ahead. Uh, the, the second book, which just came out this past week, and which we have for sale at the booth, is High Heaven, also written by Tom, uh, with art by Greg Scott. you want to tell them about that one? High Heaven is the story of a guy named David Weathers who dies prematurely and accidentally. Actually, he's being pranked by somebody when he dies, <laughs> coincidentally. It's, it's just a terrible day. Uh, piano falls on him, and he goes to heaven. <laughs> where, yeah, there it is. There it is. Yeah. He, he dies and goes to heaven, and he gets there, he finds that everything in heaven is terrible, and everybody there hates him. So that's his predicament. He's already in the last place you can ever go, and he hates it there. Um, yeah, and it's a mature reader's book. It it's, uh, it's, it's, it's very different in tone from The Wrong Earth, but I think the two of them kind of, like, establish what we want to do with the, with yeah. the company. Ex yeah, exactly. They're both, I think, beautifully drawn and professionally presented, and they're both funny in their own way. Not very jokey, but funny, no, I think. Dark, uh, dark comedy. And, mm -hmm. uh, but the resemblance ends there. We wanted to show that we could do two very different books right out of the gate. And uh, I should mention, we, uh, we are debuting at the convention 
the what we call the um, the heaven exclusive variant <laughs> cover, uh, <laughs> which is for sale for four dollars now. Um, and that the painted covers by Richard Williams, who uh, uh, painted Mad covers for many years, and he's terrific, as you can see. Um, and uh, we should talk a little bit about hashtag danger, which is the back feature um, in High Heaven. Yeah, that's me. That's drawn by Chris Geruso, who uh, is famous for G-Man. He's got a series running now called Encounter, and he's a wonderful cartoonist. He did, what, was it called Mini Marvels? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. They, were, they were great. They were great. And uh, hashtag danger is a, uh, first of all, they're the kind of people who would spell out hashtag. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll find out why in the first story. But they're scientific adventurers who go up against supernatural and obscure menaces with the intention of monetizing them. <laughs> and they are uh, very different people who are kind of thrown together and they really hate each other. <laughs> so a typical hashtag danger story is two pages of pulp action followed by three pages of them just being dicks to each other. <laughs> And uh, I should point out that there's a there's a second hashtag danger serial drawn by Randy Elliott that will appear in the back of, of our next title, Captain Ginger, which is created by me and June Brigman and uh, with art by June and Roy. And uh, this is a book that's very close to my heart. Uh, we've been developing it for quite a while uh, before Ahoy even existed. And um, I've been talking about this book a lot lately. June, do you want to do you want to take a stab at Explaining it or talking about it at all? You you start. Okay. I'll, I'll okay. <laughs> um, basically, it's um, it's all about cats in space, and uh, <laughs> you know, it's um, it's a uh, <laughs> it's it's a starship crewed by cats, and the premise is basically that uh, the human race has died out, and um, the cats, which were originally experimental subjects, um, are all that remains. And it's taken them a few generations to learn how to even run this starship. Um, and they, cats aren't really very disciplined characters. They're not much on military discipline. So um, our hero, Captain Ginger, who's the center guy here, um, has sort of an uphill battle um, trying, to, trying to hurt his team, trying to keep them together. But they have realized they need this in order to survive. So on the one hand, it's a whole lot of cat jokes. Um, on the other hand, it is it is kind of a it is a real science fiction story about um, survival and the and, and self destruction. Um, as we were working on it, June kept drawing more and more kittens um, <laughs> in the corner to the point where I had to change the premise a little bit to explain why they were all there. Um, but it's wonderful stuff. Um, I actually, June, I don't think I warned you I was going to do this, but I, I have a couple of your concept sketches here okay. for yeah. um, Sergeant Mittens and Ekru the. Uh, the, um, the cat who runs the ship's maker makes all the food and uh, stuff. Um, you want, I, also have, I also have a picture of your cat. Okay. Yeah. Um, oh. These are the two who inspired Sergeant Mittens and Captain Ginger, I think, right? Yeah, these, are, these are two cats that when we, when we moved to Atlanta, they kind of came with the house. They were both <laughs> unneutered male outdoor cats. Ooh. Uh, and they had they had a relationship very similar to the one uh, in, in our book of, of Captain Ginger and Sergeant Mittens. Um, uh, the ginger cat was Bruno, and the the black cat was named Mooch. And we don't know if they were litter mates or not. Um, they could have been. Cats sometimes can look this different and be be brothers, but they kind of had a, a love hate relationship. Um, they hung out together and. And you know, Mooch would follow um, Bruno everywhere, and Bruno would kill things, and Mooch would kind of take credit for it. And, <laughs> and sometimes they seem like best buddies, and then sometimes they would just get in these knockout, knock, you know, these fights with the dust and fur and blood flying. Wow. And um, that's that's very similar to the relationship of the characters yeah. in the book. Do you want to say anything else about your approach to the the project or anything? Uh, my approach to the project was to, you know, draw cats. Um, we have, we have I think yeah, yes. we have, uh, we, I have a lot of reference, a lot of reference, a lot of inspiration. I, yes, I am officially a crazy cat lady. I have ten cats. <laughs>
I can wow, pass. okay. Yeah, I know. I, I can't yeah. ever come to your house. <laughs> oh, no, you are well, allergic. Super oh, allergic. oh, you oh, need right. a hazmat suit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Four. How many? Four. Okay, okay. so you're just getting warmed up. I'm not going home for this. Yeah. Uh, so, and, and Stuart has uh, only two. Only two right now. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Three so we both, you know, we, we know people, but we know we know cats, and we know that like cats, cats aren't very good at following orders, mm -hmm. you know, and, and cats, if you don't do anything about it, they will reproduce. Yeah, and that's, that's a problem, that's a problem on the ship, a lot of reproduction going on. So. I just love the way you, you draw the, especially the kittens doing all sorts of little things, like this is a panel actually from a story we did, a prequel story we did for um, the anthology Mine, which was a benefit book for Planned Parenthood. Um, but you just got the little kittens like crawling off. This is Ram Scoop, the engineer, who is always having litters of kittens. And she, um, she tends to, um, she uses them as her assistants down in the engine room. Um, and there's probably some child labor problems with this that I don't really want to into in the story. But you can see that you can see them sort of crawling all over her and all over the machinery and everything. And, and uh, um, you mentioned I only have two cats right now, but I did have to put one of them up. Because he's my Captain Ginger, um, and his name's Rocco, and I just, he just needs a little equal time. He's, um, he's not really very heroic, <laughs> but uh, he's a very sweet cat. All right, um, I did want to um, throw this to Todd a little bit, because um, as he said, he designed all the, all the logos. A couple of them are getting a little cropped off the screen, but uh, um, those are the four of them there. And they're all quite different from each other. Obviously, obviously you take a different... Approach to I think it's important that since they were all different types of books, they should all look different. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the Ahoy Comics logo was the first one I did, the, uh, the symbol. And it's always cool to be asked to design a company symbol because it's so iconic, you know, it's something that's going to be there forever, hopefully. And uh, I had a lot of fun doing that one. And, you know, it was easy because when you say Ahoy, I mean, you think of something nautical. And mm -hmm. what could be more nautical than a lifesaver? <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. Um, the, it's very bold and graphic. Yeah. The, uh, the other logos, um, let's see, the uh, Snifter of Terror, that's very much in the Gaspar Saladino style that I always admired, his uh, House of Mystery and all those titles for DC. Captain Ginger is a direct takeoff from um, the pulp magazine, uh, Captain, what was the name? Captain Future? Was Captain it, what Future. Was it Thrilling Wonder? Thrilling Wonder. Oh, Thrilling Wonder. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's right. So that's a direct takeoff from that. Um, High Heaven is just me doing a, a vertigo type thing that I thought would work for that book. Yeah. And The Wrong Earth was, you know, kind of uh, just split it down the middle and make one side really horrible and one side nice and clean. <laughs> How did you, you do the broken side? Did you have to drop the logo a couple times? Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like bottom ups, you know. Yeah, don't worry, the car. Yeah, like, exactly. Yeah. You had to do it just right. Yeah. And then you saw that you saw the hashtag danger logo. I did that. That's a beauty. Yeah, yeah. That's like that a, is uh, strictly right from Irish Nap. Yeah. That's an Irish Nap style. Who lettered, oh, yeah. lettered the um, yeah. DC covers yeah. from, give uh, me two years. Well, from the late 40s to 60s, five or six. Yeah. 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 Classic style. Covers, right. Beautiful style. All right. And uh, now, since we're in Baltimore, um, the last of our four launch titles is the, one of the reasons we chose this con to make our uh, grand entrance. Um, and I personally will never forget the day I got uh, an, a giggly email about something called Edgar Allan Poe's Snifter of Terror for you guys. <laughs> and I swear I could smell the whiskey on it. Um, I think both, I think Tom and Frank, you were probably both in on the, the beginnings of that, weren't you? It's mostly Tom's idea. We, I tried to talk him out of it. Yeah, you really did. <laughs> You're still trying to talk I am. Yeah. So don't don't talk not, about it. It's not at the printer yet. No, I know. <laughs> we can change it. We, can, we don't have to do this. <laughs> we don't have to do this. It was... We wanted, we wanted to have a recognizable brand to push that we didn't have to pay for. <laughs> and we wanted to collaborate with someone who couldn't complain no matter what we did. Oh, yeah. And uh, Edgar Allan Poe fit those beautifully. And he wasn't doing anything. He wasn't doing anything. <laughs> There's the cover to number two. These oh are also by Richard Williams. These are all, yeah, we have both. The Attack of the 50-foot Edgar Allan Poe. Um, we have more coming up. But they're, uh, they are, uh, oh, that's What Me Scary? <laughs> that's the cover to number three. Nice. 
Yes. Um, we're putting this guy through the ringer. Yeah. Uh, we're dunking him. <laughs> <laughs> so, is that all you got? Yeah, yeah that's a good cover for you. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> or worse. <laughs> they get worse. They get worse. <laughs> they get worse. These things, yes. it, it's a variety of creative teams, and it really is a mix of it's 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 very humorous stuff. Like it, it is humorous yeah. stuff. The idea there's two ideas. It's one one is thing. one is we do these irreverent, snarky adaptations of Poe stories, and the other thing is that Ad, Edgar Allan Poe himself is a character in the book, and he's hit. He's drunk so much that he's hit rock bottom so hard that he's now introducing stories in a horror comic. It's the only opportunity left to him. And he resents it, but he's, the introductions are really rambling because he's so drunk. And that's the other part of the high concept. And I love these, uh, I oh, put this. a couple of tiers of, this is, the, this is a regular back feature. It's uh, Hunt Emerson, the great British cartoonist, is doing uh, a monthly two-page strip called Poe versus the Black Cat. <laughs> and, um, you can kind of see what it's about. <laughs> it's spy versus spy. It's spy versus spy. Versus spy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's silent. It's ultra-violent. It's great. Yeah. And it always ends with Poe getting kicked in the pants. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, that's um, that's basically what I have. Uh, do, do any of you guys have anything you want to add to what we've talked about or anything? Well, we, I, I would like to add that for Poe, we have some great creators lined yeah. up. We've got Mark Russell writing, who's uh, famous for doing the Flintstones lately, that adult take on the Flintstones everybody loves so much. Mm -hmm. uh, Rachel Pollock, uh, my old Doom Patrol crony. And uh, uh, Anne Nascenti has written a story. Linda Medley. Linda Medley? Yeah. And we have, we have some great Rick, people. Rick Geary? Rick Geary. Yeah. Through the Rachel Pollock story. Yeah, I don't know if you remember him from the back of National Lampoon years ago, but he is a great cartoonist. Yeah. Beautiful stuff. Um, and well, Fred Harper. Yeah. Fred Harper's. Fred Harper. Yeah, yeah, awesome. He kills it. Yeah. Kills it. Yeah. Peter Schneeberg kills yeah. it. Yeah. Oh, it's amazing. Uh, it's a beautiful book. That's a really yeah. beautiful book. For something so willfully snarky and stupid. It looks great. <laughs> <laughs> it looks a lot better than it There's a tagline yeah. for the company. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's us. Yeah. Actually, we don't look that good. <laughs> All right. Well, um, if, uh, if you guys want to, anybody wants to chime in anything else, otherwise we could just open things up to questions for the audience now. Um, yeah. Stuart, yeah. you should probably mention what we were talking about earlier, all the ways the uh, books are going to be available. Oh. Um, the Ahoy books, you mean? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, obviously, the uh, the initial books are available in comic shops and on Comixology, um, same day, same price, um, which is basically three ninety nine for everything. Uh, the first issue, Captain Ginger, by the way, is a, a full thirty five page story in addition to the back features. And we haven't actually talked about that very much. The Ahoy books are packed with um, extra text stories and, in some cases, back feature comics. Um, we're really trying to make this. As um, as full a package as we can. We want this to be something you can actually. It, it, you you won't be done with it in five minutes. It's a it's a it's a substantive read, and that will continue. That's not just the first issues. It's a meal, not a snack. It's a meal, not a snack. But uh, yeah, we're we're already working on the. Uh, tr we're actually. I was just talking with uh, in the spring probably. I don't have exact dates, and probably wrong Earth first because that'll be um, that'll be that's the first one out. Um, but uh, but yeah, you can uh, you should be able to get them through your comic shop. We actually ship some extra copies of Wrong Earth, so um, that should be hanging around. And again, we have uh, both Wrong Earth and both editions of High Heaven Number One at the booth, um, cover price. And these uh, short stories Stuart mentioned that are in the back of the book. We look originally we like we were looking through old comics to see if there anything. If there was anything that people used to do and don't do anymore that would be good today. And one of them was they used to run short stories in the back of comic books before letter pages because they needed to run text in the books in order to qualify for cheap postal right? Magazine, so, right? Yeah. so they would like just pay somebody as little as possible to write something as fast as they could and it would be like, you know, out of the space patrol or something. That's what and we're no doing. one would read it. And we were looking at it and we thought, what if these were good? <laughs> and so we're trying to get good stories and we, we have a lot of cool people from outside of comics but the first three stories are by Graham Morrison 
<coughs> and they're wow. great, and they're hilarious. They're really yeah. funny. So, really fun. Tom just contacted him and he said, here's three. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. He's been waiting all his life, right? He has. <laughs> he has. They were ready. I'm pretty sure that's how Mickey Spillane got started. It is. Yeah, that's probably. right. Yeah. yeah. That is. And Stan Lee, yeah. too. Yeah. Yeah. When I started at DC, I was still doing the headers for those. They still had the oh, They still had them. Yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah. No kidding. Yeah. It's allowed us to work in, like, uh, like Tom said, a lot of writers and also artists, because they each have between one and four illustrations. Mm -hmm. um, who we all, who we otherwise wouldn't have, be, wouldn't be able to scoop, to fit in for a while, and that's allowed us to. Um, this was a gatefold ad we ran in the, for our second month in Diamond Previews, and that's those are all the, our the uh, creators we have in our October books, and that's only four books, so it's it's kind of uh, it's nice. It it just lets us um it lets us work with um, prose writers, uh, artists who are too busy to do a full story, um, all kinds of different. All different kinds of people. Or artists whose style is so out there that they probably wouldn't fit most of the stories we do, but yeah. they fit this beautifully. You, uh, you hired someone who was working, who was a manager of a restaurant in my neighborhood, I think, who just did beautiful, beautiful pieces. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We went in there and uh, she had done this amazing piece on the blackboard of the restaurant, so we asked her to do one for her books. <laughs> oh, yeah. Shannon Wheeler. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. What? He did a com. He does a strip in the gig. back of a uh, longer number one. For the gag. Yeah. The first, our first three comics, in addition to a Grant Morrison story, there's a gag cartoon by Shannon, like a Too single much panel man. cartoon. Yeah. Too much coffee, man. So. So that's great. Yes. <laughs> Any other questions? Anyone have the? Yeah. No, there you go. Why a hoy? Oh, we're not, that's a mystery for now. There is a reason. Like I said, Hart and Frank and I have known each other for like decades and decades and decades, and we have all this friendship backstory. And there is, I, I suppose, possibly guessable, I will tell you it's an acronym that I can't tell you anymore yet. But it's an old friendy engine. Yeah. I think it's discoverable, though. Like, I, I think I, it, it, might discoverable. Yeah, probably. Yeah. it might be discoverable. It might be discoverable. First of all, thank you, Todd, for all your hard work. Um, in my comics database, I think you are number one. I don't know how you letter every book I have. <laughs> um, it's, it's really incredible. Um, so what, what kind of uh, comic publisher do you guys hope to be? So, you know, there's publishers like Marvel where they own the characters and they find creators. There's publishers like Image where you bring a book to them. You know, there's Dynamite where they're licensing stuff. What what type of publishers Ahoy want to be or try to be? That's an interesting question. I don't think we've thought about it in those terms yet, where we want to do it all one way or anything. Um, we're going to do a lot of creator-owned work. Um, the stuff I'm doing is my equity in the company, so I'm giving it to the company. And, uh, but uh, I don't think you'll see a lot of licensed stuff. As long as there are dead people like Poe we can use, <laughs> we probably won't do a lot of licensed stuff where we actually have to pay people and, and please them. Um, yeah, I, I will say we're, we're defi definitely a, a comics publisher. We're not, this is not an IP farm or anything. Like, we're, no. not, um, we're not trying to make, um, it, it's not impossible that. Some, something could turn into a film or a TV show somewhere down the line, but that's not our, um, that's not our focus at all. Like, no. we're very, very much concentrated on, uh, on trying, to get, uh, trying to get the best comics we, may, we can and being flexible with the deals we make with creators in order to make that happen. Mm -hmm. I notice these are all funny. Is that something you're going towards? Or Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you mentioned that. We want them all to be funny on some level. We don't need them to be sitcoms or joke-a-thons. I mean, Probably Poe is the closest thing to a lot of jokes, but I think they're all somehow funny if just in the situations and watching humans forced to be themselves. <laughs> you, uh, you had a line in one of the early promotional interviews where you said, it's 2018, couldn't you use a laugh? Right. Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah, that's kind of the philosophy behind it. Yeah, yes. I basically got two questions. Question number one. Do you think our local comic shops can do subscriptions to y'all's comics? Because I'm thinking about describing to Captain Ginger. 
Uh, if they do, if they do pull services, they should. Um, it's it's absolutely available through Diamond, and uh, they should be able to have it. Also, DCBS. So. Yeah. Just got a comic book shirt. Oh. Comic truck to me is far like comics, so. I'm sorry. Plus, it's comic truck to me is far like comics. Okay. Okay. So they should be able to. They, they should, should be, be able, able to. to. Yes. 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 Right. They, they have a diamond account. They should be able to. And my question number two is, did y'all hear about what happened on June 22nd last year? And what's your thoughts? No, I don't know what you're what referring to. I'm sorry. June 22nd of 2016. I think it was 2016. Yeah, it was 2016. About the Navajo shooting at the Gazette. Or 28th. Or 28th. Thursday the 28th, June 28th. Yeah, I heard about it, yeah. 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 Because the scary thing is, because I work near there. Right. And I'm a counselor who works in the same building. Uh huh. Yeah. And when I found out from customers, I was like, oh crap. I was, my first thought was my counselor, because she works like right below it. Oh, how awful. Yeah, yeah. It yeah. tragic. Yeah, it was tragic and yeah. terrible. I, I, I sort of, I, I am actually. It's an interesting question because um, I actually did an interview for a friend of mine who's, work, who's doing her thesis on gun violence. And um, one of the things that came up was the fact that we have so many shootings and it just seems to be a daily occurrence. And, you know, I, you know not to like bring it down, but what happened was absolutely horrible, was absolutely tragic. There really is no reason why we should be in this position. You know, there's so many things that we can do in terms of tracking weapons, ensuring, you know, just licensing, just everything that the fact that we are here and in 2018, we're still having this discussion after Sandy Hook, after, you know, you know Stoneman Douglas, after everything. It's just, you know, we, we need to get into a better, a better place as a society in general. Yeah. Because I'm afraid I come to my work right down the street. Right. No, I, oh, uh, yeah. I you know, so I have a 10 year old, and, you know, they're starting to talk about, like, weapons drills in schools. Yeah. And that, I don't want, or the, you know, she, you know, being my kid, she's politically minded anyway, but I don't want her to have to think about those types yeah. of things. Yeah, school safety and everything. Yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. Um, what kind of foot are you guys down to? More superheroes or more not superheroes? Probably more not. Probably yeah. more not, but we'll, we'll do superheroes when we get a good idea for one. Yeah, the trick with superheroes is the, uh, the field is so saturated with them that um, you don't want to just try and go up against Marvel and DC playing their game because they yeah. do they do so much they do it well and they do it so much of it you know I don't uh, I don't want to do a superhero story where the question you're asking is will the good guys beat the bad guys <laughs> <laughs> you know I'd rather if there if I can think of a better question then I could I could see it or if it's kind of funny or a, a fresh take mm -hmm. yeah there. yeah um, this is a question for um, so in designing can you talk a little bit about how you um, Design Dragonfly oh, Man versus yeah. versus uh, Dragonfly. Absolutely, actually, it's, it's funny. We were when uh, we were developing the the project. I was actually in Japan on vacation, and uh, talking to Tom via email like the entire time that I was right. there, because like, I was really, like as soon as we like we we clicked automatically and just started tossing ideas back. And while I was in Japan, I, my family and I went to the Samurai Museum in Tokyo. And one of the things, one of the exhibits was samurai armor. And a constant uh, theme in samurai honor, armor during the Edo period was a dragonfly. In Japanese society, dragonflies re represent nobility, honor, you know, the warrior spirit. Uh, so. You know, I pitched to Tom, like, why don't we call him Dragonfly, and, you know, <laughs> Dragonfly Man. And Tom immediately goes, you know what, that could work because in European society, dragonflies are considered evil and demon, demons, <laughs> creatures. <Yeah. laughs> so, yeah, so that, that, that was basically the, 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 the genesis of where I started from that. 
So I actually designed Dragonfly first, and a lot of my influences for Dragonfly came from Ninja Team Gotchaman and Moldiver, a little bit, you know, classic, like, you know, modern superhero, a little bit of, like, you know, the, the Ben Affleck Batman, but not too much, you know. I didn't want to, like, slap a utility belt on him or anything. Um, he stores all his weapons in his gauntlets. He has utility knuckles. Yes, his utility <laughs> knuckles. So, you know, once, you know, I had, like, the base design for Dragonfly done, I reverse engineered, basically. I started looking at, like, Spy Smasher and, like, 40s inspired heroes, you know, uh, Spy Smasher being probably, like, the biggest one because he's the only character from that period who doesn't have, like, you know, trunks on. Everybody else, you know, is doing, like, the same, like, two-tone suit. And his his costume is like primarily green with like accent, with like brown mask or if I remember correctly, but you know he's got like this diamond motif. So you know, and you know again, you know there's so only so many shapes that you can use for like symbols and everything. But since I had designed the dragonfly uh, costume first, it was easier to take those base elements and find like you know what's the golden age version, you know what will it do. So, you know, again, the same thing with the goggles, where Dragonfly's goggles are very, you know, opaque and they cover his eyes. Dragonfly Man's goggles have a little light inside the lenses. So to, to and I actually was inspired by Family a little bit, where, you know, it's just distracting enough so you can't, you know, you don't really look directly into his face, you know, there's like little lights and, you know, in the lens, in like the rim of the lenses of their goggles, <coughs> both on him and Stinger. And it was kind of the same thing, like once I had the designs for both versions of those characters, they made it easier for me to design Stinger as well, which is, you know, I gave him, you know, these butterfly, <laughs> butterfly wings, these are yeah. such like a, such a cute little design, you know, the hair, like the, you know, the, the hair swooping up and just very smiley. And then Frank just did like a great, you know, deconstruction of my design, you know. And then like, you know, you've got Omega Stinger, which is, you yeah. know, very much in the mold of Omega Dragonfly, much more, you know, dark and ominous and, you know. And that could, you put that kind of thought into the whole world. Oh, yeah. Two worlds. Yeah. I mean, they're both so different architecturally and the machines and the vehicles. And, yeah, with, and with, with Earth Alpha especially, I mean, Earth Omega is much more like our real world, so that was the, the easier part. It was just sort of giving it that uh, much more grittier and darker texture. With Earth Alpha, a lot of the technology is basically concept technology. It's stuff that was never produced. So I went and looked at old, like, you know, nothing like really obvious. I didn't want to start pulling from, pulling from like Art Deco so much because then it starts to look too much like Batman the Animated Series. So, but I started looking at old Japanese concept cars, uh, cell phones that were never produced, uh, old, you know, stuff from old movies. I have all of these books at home on like 70s, furniture and furnishings and then like mm -hmm. old Frank Lloyd mm -hmm. Wright architectural stuff. So that was the stuff that I wanted to fill uh, Earth Alpha with. And the same thing, like, you know, the villains are very much inspired by 60s television. You know, mm -hmm. uh, the vehicles are all concept vehicles. Uh, the design for Deuce in particular <coughs> is very much inspired by like Goldie Hawn and Judy Karn from like Laughing. <laughs> you know, so, so you know that that you know, okay. but you know she's wearing you know a full patent leather outfit. You know, which I didn't know was a thing back in the '60s, but there was like this whole like patent leather you know you know thing that they were doing back then. So that's like that the the, the whole focus of her outfit is sort of like taking those classic elements and really, you know, playing with them. I, I love Deuce, like Deuce yeah, really her. falls over the course of the series. She's the best. Anybody else? Yeah, okay. Thanks, first, I love that EC reference in the, uh, in the Stinger story. Yeah. <laughs> that was classy. Uh, but, okay, you've got three titles going now, one coming on next week. Uh, it, it seems like you just 
booming on the uh, number of titles going. What do you think your carrying capacity is going to be? Four. Four. <laughs> <laughs> really, that's about as much as we can do right now. Um, yeah, and they're they're it's all they're all miniseries to start with. Like they're all they're all designed in seasons of four to six issues, depending on the book. Yeah, and they will they would be, come back. Yeah, they, yeah the, the idea is they will come back, but there will be other ones cycled in. So we're already planning our second wave of stories of series to start in March and April, and uh, a lot of that stuff is well underway. Um, one that I'm writing and, and have co-created, which is uh, which I can't tell you about yet, is uh, is the first issue is completely done. The second issue is well underway. Um, the other series, which is also really great, is almost finished. Um, it's not colored, but almost everything else is done. So we're, we've been planning way ahead, and we're gonna, we, we, we have things slotted in that way. And by the time some of those series are winding up, we'll probably come back with High Heaven or, um, or Captain Ginger or one of those. So mm -hmm. we're definitely continuing Captain Ginger. Yeah, um, yeah, issue one of the wrong earth just just shit. I'm penciling issue six, so so, <laughs> so we're, we're pretty, good shit. Yeah. What do you think the lag will be between the end of an arc and the trade paper? We're we're working, working out we're working out that as the the lag before the trade paperback. We're trying to get that stuff out as soon as possible. There are some distribution questions we need to figure out, and I've actually been working on that this weekend. I don't have a hard answer for that. Um, it will depend a little bit. Wrong Earth is scheduled to end in, uh, uh, is it February or January? February, February. I think. Um, and we're trying to get the trade out a, a few months after that. Um, yeah. But I don't have exact timing yet. So we'll go by a cat meeting. Captain Ginger's one of your mature titles, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's actually not labeled, but there is some violence in it. Um, but it's, 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 it's probably not all ages. Pretty much. I don't like to it's use the word. Not a kidding. I don't like to use the words all ages because people think of stuff as suitable for very young right. children. Yeah. There's, there's, there's a. a it depends sure. depending on who you talk to. There's a connotation with all ages. So. Yeah. Yeah. Something yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah, it might be a little young, but I don't know. It's, it's not. There's no. Um, well, there's no sex in it now. No. Uh, and, uh, no. and there's no swearing, you know. So it's, there's a lot of kittens now. Yeah. There's a lot of kittens. There's a lot of. Um, there's there's some violence, but you know it comes and goes. Cat fight. Yeah. Well, the, the rats don't make out too well. That's a spoiler. <laughs> but, uh, I would say none of our stuff is that terrible. Yeah, um, I know. I, <laughs> It should be like high heaven. It should it should say rated P for potty mouth. That's Ooh, about yeah. it. There's a couple suggestive gags in there, but nothing terrible. Poe, we could go anywhere with, I suppose. But but we don't even that. But not, even that is yeah. not too rough. Um, is there a reason in the universe why some of the cats are human-like and some are cat-like? There is. There is, uh, and oh. it's a little. Complicated. I don't really want to go into that right now. It, it's a, it's, it's a little complicated. Not all the little cats are. Some of the little cats are. Well, I, I can just say this actually. Some of the, some of the little cats, are kittens of the big cats, mm -hmm. and they will grow up okay. to yeah. be evolved cats. Okay. Some of them are just cats. Like some of them, so like not all the cats on board the ship were evolved, um, and that's why there are so many of them yeah. around. But I don't know if we ever actually explained that because every time I thought about doing it, it just got too complicated. Like I just <laughs> room on the page. Stop too. the story. Yeah, stop the story. But that's basically what's going on. And the uh, obviously the um, the bigger cats and the and the more evolved cats feel very protective of some of the other cats. There are also feral cats living in the um, living in the in the ducts and crannies of the ship. So it's a it's a things of. They they call the they call the humans feeders, and with the feeders gone, things have gotten a little chaotic, as you might expect. Yeah. There's yep. a lot of. Did you draw any inspiration from Red Dwarf? Uh, from Red Dwarf, the cat. Uh, I, I I love Red Dwarf. I, I I don't think I had it consciously in mind, but maybe. Uh, have you seen that show, Jen? Uh, British show. Um, one of the it takes place on a space station in the far future, and one of the characters is like the descendant of the ship's cat. Cat. He's, he's huge. He's, he's human, like human <laughs> but yeah, he's got like fangs oh, and things, oh. and he does goofy things. Oh, like, I have it's, to a, watch that. it's pretty much a farce. It's yeah. a long-running British, uh, yeah. British sitcom. And that's yeah.
Um, are you folks geographically in the same area? Do you use mostly uh, email and, and things like that? It's mostly email. Stuart and I actually live pretty close together, but Tom and Hart and Frank all live up, um, upstate New York. We're yeah. from Georgia. They're in Georgia. We have in Jersey. Yeah. We have contributors all over the world, actually. Yeah, it's a, uh, I mean, even in the time we've been in comics, it's become so much easier to work with people anywhere. Yeah. Like, just uh, everything's, everything's on servers, everything's email. Yes. Yeah. My, my anchor, Juan Castro, uh, uh, actually lives in Tijuana. Mm -hmm. so, and we've been working together for six years, off and on. Yeah, I'm kind of on your website and looking at that number three cover for Captain Ginger. Mm -hmm. I swear to God, Mono looks, like, looks exactly like my wrist from Cat Nicky. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's nice. I can pull that up. We have lots of inspiration from the real kids. Guys, yeah, Mike Rescue Cat Nicky, she's a Siamese nest. I can pull that up. We have a Balinese kid. Yeah, Balamese and Siamese are almost exactly like each other. Because <laughs> Nick is basically cross between a snowshoe and a traditional. Take the number three. There you are. It almost looks exactly like my cat Nikki. <laughs> oh, the one in the background. Yeah. yeah. That's Ekru. She's a really interesting character. She's, uh, she's touchy. She's, uh, she's inspired by a cat I almost adopted once, who was just very, like, would flinch away when you try to do uh, trying to, trying to touch her. Yes, sir. I was just curious, are you all pretty much exclusive to Hawaii at this point to get the company going and uh, moving, or do you just venture out and do different things as well still, or? Well, I'm kind of a whore, so. <laughs> <laughs> Now we don't have to say it. You saved us the trouble. <laughs> uh, it, it I all think, depends. I think yeah. I'm the only person who's exclusive to Ahoy that I know of. Everybody else is well, free, you're doing free to roam. You're doing pretty much everything. So well, I do a lot of things. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a, I, I have a few other things. I've written an X-Men novel that's coming out in January. Um, I've been doing some little stuff for DC here and there. Um, yeah, it's been a it's been a busy year actually, but more and more. I mean, the nature of the way artists work is often they are you're functionally exclusive for a period of time right, just right. because it takes up all your time uh, right. while you're doing the project. But uh, actually, um, like June and Roy uh, draw the uh, comic strip Mary Worth as well. Uh, yeah, it's very interesting because we are uh, usually working on the two things simultaneously, and they're very different. And, uh, yeah. Captain to... Ginger is a lot more fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, especially now we have a storyline that has uh, dogs in it. And... <laughs> <laughs> Which is similar to a cat. It's furry. <laughs> That's more like Mary Worth should get some cats. Oh, well, we think we, so too. We've but told, I, I the writer doesn't that, agree. But she, she's never had a cat before. Uh, okay. I don't think she could write. Mm -hmm. If you don't have cats, mm -hmm. it would be hard to write cats. Yeah. If we well, ever take it over, Mary Worth dead. <laughs> yeah. It's just about 5 o'clock, so we're probably going to have to wrap up. Do you have one more? Well, I just wanted to contribute something to the cats discussion. Okay. Cats are always trying to mind you who's in charge, and by the way, it's not you. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I did have a cat. Uh, it was my wife's cat. Uh, that she brought with her from Paris. This is the only cat that I'd ever seen pull a king cake out of a closed cabinet and devour it. So, <laughs> oh. yeah, they're 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 yes, they are. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, thank you guys for coming again. Stop by, stop by our booth. We have uh, we have not only uh, the books for sale. We have t-shirts and caps and avoid bathrobes. We do. Yes. If you feel, yes. if you feel extravagant.